thanks to the Society for inviting me to give this very prestigious uh, Gary Price uh, Memorial Lecture. Um, in this lecture, I'm, I'm going to give, hopefully, a, a sense of the work that I've been involved with over the, well, since the turn of the century, really. I mean, impulsivity has been a, a theme which has been running throughout the lab. Um, it's not the only project we do, but it's one which has been central to many things that we've been thinking about over, over the years. And I think like all good psychological terms, once you give it, put it in the hands of a neuroscientist, neuroscientists tend to make things more complicated and nuanced. There's no exception for impulsivity. I think probably it's intuitively obvious what it means, but nevertheless we argue and debate about that term. Uh, Trevor Robbins and I came up with, with this definition. Um, I think everyone accepts that it's multidimensional, uh, it's no longer this unitary cons construct. Um, it, I think the best way of thinking about it is a predisposition for rapid and often premature actions. But the most important point is that last bit about the appropriate foresight. You can think of reflection impulsivity, that we tend to act on impulse without thinking about the consequences of our behaviour. And of course, we can't go too far without thinking historically about this experiment that was run at Stanford University by Michelle and colleagues. Very simple experiment on delayed gratification. Young children would be placed into a room. There would be a table. Um, on a plate, there would be one or two marshmallows. And the children were simply asked to restrain um, from eating that marshmallow for various lengths of time, up to 15 minutes. And you can see the anguish on this child's face as that waiting interval elapses, and eventually the impulse breaks through and the marshmallow is consumed. And this idea of tolerance for waiting intervals and delayed rewards is especially important in many neuropsychiatric disorders linked to impulsivity. Uh, there are two uh, very important people to think about in this field. One is Philippe uh, Soubre, 1986, came out with what was at the time a blockbuster paper looking more objectively uh, at um, how 5-HT in particular suppressed behavior that was essentially suppressed by punishment. And that was a great revelation in the field that there was a neurotransmitter which we could study um, in the context of impulsivity. This great review, I think it's been cited over 1,500 times now by John Everton, looks at the various forms of impulsivity. I've mentioned um, delayed gratification, this inability to wait. There are lots of forms. So we can look at resistance to delay of reinforcement. We can think of impairments in timing. Um, I've talked about that one called preparation. This is reflection impulsivity, that we act with very little information. Um, but the one I'll concentrate today is premature responding. This is when we have a notion of an expected reward sometime in the future, and our actions are simply omitted um, too early or, or too quickly. <clears throat> and why do we care about impulsivity? As I've mentioned, it's linked with many neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is a prevalent neurodevelopmental disorder, and it's marked by an intolerance for delayed rewards. And we can think of these hidden or silent phenotypes which sit beneath the surface, which are measurable and quantitative, and in this context, the candidate end of phenotype is rather steep delay gradients around primary incentives like food. And if you look then at this notion, you can then begin to think of brain mechanisms and potential genetic uh, and other etiological mechanisms. But the behavior which is expressed is about delay aversion, this intolerance for delayed rewards. Other disorders, and this is a disorder which I've been working on a lot over the years, is impulsivity as an antecedent, a forerunner to addiction, rather than being a consequence of drug abuse itself. And George Cube uh, and Lamole came up with this idea that impulsivity is essentially um, an act which happens precipitately. Um, it generates pleasure in the short term, um, but eventually there's regret and guilt and self-remorse about the action itself, which leads to attention, appraisal of one's actions, but essentially the behavior can happen again. And this impulsivity essentially is driven by positive reinforcement. 
a relationship with the food incentive or the other incentives which may be linked with that behavior. Eventually, George realized that there's a serial connection between impulsivity and compulsivity, that compulsive phenotypes like drug taking and drug seeking can be mediated by the relief of anxiety, essentially coping reactions to stress and the stress of, and the stresses that are listed by protracted drug use. Karen Ursher in Cambridge, we've championed this idea of waiting impulsivity, and waiting impulsivity is essentially a choice between instant gratification with drug use and discounting the longer term punishments of or the consequences of drug use. And that may be unemployment, homelessness, personal harm. And essentially we become very myopic about drugs and we discount all the harms in the future. So I've already mentioned this definition, this defining feature of impulsivity is that we become in the moment and things which are going to happen tomorrow, next week, a month, hence, become discounted or attenuated. Okay, so I've mentioned waiting impulsivity and I've mentioned also that impulsivity is not easy. Um, we think this is the easiest categorization of impulsivity between stopping and waiting. I won't talk about stopping today, but it implicates the dorsal stratum and a, a distinct neural net network in the brain as opposed to the waiting impulsivity networks, which are built around choice and delay aversion for future rewards, and importantly, premature responding. Now those two forms of waiting impulsivity implicate different regions of the nucleus accumbens, the premature responding, recruiting the shell or medial nucleus accumbens, and impulsive choice, risky choice around drug use, implicating the core of the nucleus accumbens. And if you can see to the far left, that the network includes cortical areas, including medial prefrontal cortex, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, medial and lateral orbitofrontal cortex. There's overlap, but there's also distinctions in the waiting and stopping impulsivity networks. And I've mentioned that the talk is about the usual suspects. Of course, Casablanca, you know, round up the usual suspects. I think when we dive into the brain and we think about neuropharmacology, Immediately, we're drawn to the dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonergic systems. And indeed, when one looks at dopamine, one can find compelling evidence for a link between dopamine, impulsivity, and ADHD. In the top left, Nora Volkow using positron emission tomography. Uh, these are adults with ADHD, a very rare group. They're not medicated, so we don't have the confound of stimulant drug use for treatment. In yellow, you can see the area within the basal ganglia where there's low D2, D3 receptor availability. So as a biomarker, D2 receptors have been linked to ADHD. The lower left, Buckholz, published in 2010 in Science, created a storm. Again, this was positron emission tomography. But here, what they did, they localized the reduction in D2 receptors to the midbrain, the mesenkephalum, the the point or source of dopamine neurons where the cell bodies are located. In other words, these are inhibitory somatodentritic D2 receptors. When they're low in expression, you have elevated dopamine release in the stratum. So this breakthrough of behavior we think of as, as an impulsive act may be just that dopamine is inappropriately suppressed through these somatodentritic D2 receptors. We can look at genetic variants, these tandem repeats in the D4 receptor, there, the evidence is not so compelling. Other work, um, Del Campo using positron emission tomography, ADHD and um, control participants. You can look at inattention, you can look at hyperactivity, and you can see an inverse relationship. In other words, when D2 receptors are low in number, in this case it is the striatum, you can see that it's inversely related to attention and hyperactivity. And of course, we can't escape the idea that ADHD is treated by psychostimulant drugs, which themselves block the uptake of catecholamines like noradrenaline and dopamine. Noradrenaline, well, the case is quite simple there. We have drugs like Stratera, the trade name for atomoxetine, the select noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. Craig Berridge and Amy Arnstead hypothesized that the beneficial effects of atomoxetine are mediated within 
prefrontal cortex through actions at the alpha 2A receptor in concert with dopamine acting at the D1 receptor. And Dana uh, Economidou um, was a postdoc in my group, sadly died um, eight years ago. She's a Cypriot. I was there last week um, with the family. Dana published this wonderful study identifying a second locus mediating the effects of atomoxetine, not within the cortex, but within the shell of the nucleus accumbens, mediating premature responding. And what Dana showed was you can give atomoxetine to a rat. This is a five-choice task, which I'll mention more about, but it measures premature responding or impulsivity. In red, you can see atomoxetine has reduced, reduced the number of premature responding responses. And when you give atomoxetine directly into the shell, you can generate the same response of the same magnitude which is an impressive demonstration that atomoxetine has a particular point in this dopamine, but also noradrenaline-rich area of the basal, ventral basal ganglia. Serotonin, I started work with serotonin on the notion that low serotonin in the brain was linked to impulsive aggressiveness. This is work in non-human primates, looking at CSF metabolites, um, Lynn Fairbanks and others, to the work I've already mentioned, Philippe uh, Soubre, understanding that low 5-HT releases behavior, behavior that's been punished. And this release of behavior we call behavioral disinhibition. And it's a strong phenotype for impulsive characteristics. Valerie Voon, in the Department of Psychiatry, she and I have been working together to translate premature, res premature responses in humans and in rodents. This is the human version. It's a four-choice task. It's on a computerized touchscreen. Um, the participant is withholding a space bar on the computer um, for, on variable intervals. A target stimulus in green is presented in any one of those boxes. Now, for a human, this is very straightforward. You simply wait for the stimulus and respond. You're not going to make many premature responses under those conditions. We make the task more interesting by incentivizing with money. So before the task, we, look at, we calculate the mean reaction time for an individual. And if, on a particular trial, the individual goes faster, and depending on how fast they go, we give them either 10p, 50p, or a pound. And that really incentivized people to go as quickly as possible to the target green stimulus. And under those conditions, you have a measurable level of premature responses. Now, we can translate that work into um, rats. This chap here to the left is called Zippy. Zippy is a naturally impulsive animal. We discovered Zippy uh, at the turn of the century. And it's an outbred strain of lister-hooded rats. And approximately 8 to 10% of these animals are impulsive on this five-choice task. The five-choice task, animals train over three months, approximately, to respond to a light stimulus. And on the challenge day, we increase the waiting interval from the expected five seconds to seven seconds. Under those conditions, Zippy and his uh, hyperactive or hyperimpulsive counterparts make more premature responses. But it's a direct analogy to the human four choice, except in rats we make it harder and have five holes. Okay, in Cambridge, um, my lab has now moved to this building. It's the Translational Neural Imaging Center. We have a 9.4 Tesla scanner, a micro PET. Uh, we've developed pipelines for uh, spectroscopy, structural volumetric analyses, um, and rodents and marmosets. And the first collection of studies used positron uh, emission tomography, where we um, a compound like a D2 receptor antagonist um, would have a tag, normally carbon or F18. Um, we've opted for F18 because of a longer half-life. And essentially, the radio tracer binds the receptor, uh, releases a positron collides with an electron and releases gamma radiation, which we can pick up in the tomograph, which is uh, essentially we can look at these so-called annihilation events and build up an image where this tracer is binding in the brain. Our very first and very old study, um, 2007 now, this was um, hyperactive or hyperimpulsive animals contrasted with low impulsive animals in the five choice task. The, up, the tracer in this case was phalipride which is a high affinity D2, D3 receptor antagonist. This is a horizontal section of rat brain 
where you can see the nucleus accumbens from anterior to posterior regions, and in the high impulse funnel, the significant reduction in the uptake of this D2, D3 receptor antagonist. There's a low impulsive animal, and it's aligned on structure, and that color is the uptake of the tracer itself. The story continued, and we did a lot of work with cocaine and um, particular methylphenidate to understand the relation or the interaction between baseline variation in D2 receptors and potentially the therapeutic effects of methylphenidate and how it might act to alleviate impulsivity. To cut a long story short, what we found was that in the high impulsive animals in the top, before methylphenidate, you can see the low binding potential of phalipride. After methylphenidate, the post-methylphenidate, you see that it increases D2, D3 receptor availability. And if you look at the, on the x-axis, the baseline against the change in binding potential, you can see this inverse relationship. This is consistent for those who are working in the ADHD field of, of rate dependency, that the effects of stimulant drugs depend on the baseline, be it receptors or behavior. And if your baseline is low, stimulant drugs tend to elevate. If your baseline is high, it tends to uh, decrease that baseline. OK, so the talk is about beyond the usual, usual suspects. I've talked about dopamine and noradrenaline and 5-HT. Within the nucleus accumbens, of course, it's not just about dopamine. Of course, we have glutamatergic inputs from the prefrontal cortex. We have dopamine afferents from the midbrain. We have inhibitory interneurons from GABA and astrocytes, which is for another day. But we're also working on astrocytes in the lab. Um, our first study was looking at GABA, and we used uh, magnetic resonance imaging um, and uh, voxel-based morphometry. And here we could look at the density of gray matter. This is a cross-section of the rat brain. Uh, the gray is structure. The colored uh, significant clusters is the voxel-based morphometry showing a decline in gray matter density in this region. And you can see that it's a very strong relationship between the number of premature responses on the five-choice task and the decrease in the gray matter density. And of course, what you can do in a rat, but you can't do in humans, is ask the question, well, what's so special about that highlighted region within the nucleus accumbens itself? And what we did, we dissected that region, uh, carried out ex vivo uh, western blotting to look at proteins. And what we discovered, within the left hemisphere, a reduction in the enzyme responsible for the synthesis of GABA, um, MAP2 and spinophilin are all markers of spines, um, the dendrites or medium spiny neurons. You can see that the effect appears to be stronger in the left hemisphere, consistent with our imaging results, but it's also apparent within the right hemisphere, but just not so obvious. We've followed the study up with RNA silencing and also spectroscopy, where we can um, apply a voxel within the ventral striatum uh, itself. In this case, it is the striatum. And Steve Sariak has published looking at low and high impulsive animals, the GABA signal with spectroscopy to note a significant reduction in GABA within the voxel and the striatum. Um, this structure, the insular cortex, is something which has really captured our uh, thoughts recently. It's an area which constantly and continuously pops up in our experiments. Our first clue to its importance and impulsivity was at the top left, we developed an algorithm to look at cortical thickness in the rat brain. You can produce these wonderful heat maps to determine how thick the cortex is. Um, we're doing a developmental study now and looking at the growth and retraction of those areas. But in this study, we noted in the high impulsive animal that the insular cortex was thinner in um, structure, and it also correlated with the strength of the premature responding on this task. And of course, those who are working in the insular cortex will know this is an area involved in interoception, our internal processing of visceral and somatic signals. Uh, Becker uh, published a study in Science showing that if you damage this region, a stroke in this region actually cures smoking addiction. So if you can think of craving and smoking, if you damage that reason, the cravings go away and you cure. Curing. It's a really interesting relationship with drug addiction.
but it's one we've also spotted. This paper is just coming out, we probably think this week. We've been working a lot with Boehringer Ingleheim to look at um, markers within prefrontal cortex associated with the high impulsivity um, phenotype. And the one marker we've, we've stumbled on is myelinositol. And our first clue was again with spectroscopy, where we had a, a voxel within prefrontal cortex and striatum. A reduction in the concentration within the voxel of the prefrontal cortex. Boehring and Ingelheim in Germany then took those animals and used mass spec to directly measure myelinositol as a validation of the in vivo imaging technique and found a significant reduction in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. We were able to silence various genes that um, imp A, this is um, inositol monophosphatase 1, involved in the synthesis of MI, myelinositol. If you had a low impulsive animal and silencing that gene, you could generate a high impulsive animal. And so there was evidence, including gene expression studies, all converging on the idea that low myelinositol was also linked to this impulsivity uh, tendency in this these rats. So I'll return now to this, this weighting impulsivity. And this is the weighting network in more detail. At the center, at the core, is the nucleus accumbens core. And it has a reciprocal and opponent relationship with the shell. The usual suspects, dopamine, 5-HT, and noradrenaline, modulate activity within these straital domains. Hippocampus, amygdala have important inputs but especially the prefrontal cortex, which is suppressing these impulsive actions and decisions. And so it's a very important structure, which is having an overriding control over behaviors which is selected within basal ganglia. The structure in red, the infralimbic or the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is probably the most important prefrontal area for premature responding. And you can see that it has topographical inputs into the shell the region where atomoxetine had those dramatic effects with Dana Economidou. And within ventromedial prefrontal cortex, we've been very interested in looking at the relationship between glutamate, of course, these are the pyramidal neurons, the output neurons from prefrontal cortex, the inhibitory populations of GABAergic neurons, and modulator inputs from 5-HT and, and other monoamine systems. This study from uh, Emily Murphy, a PhD uh, D student, in the group, um, used a drug called CPP, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist, and infused this directly into the infralimbic cortex. And if you block NMDA receptors in this region, you see a dramatic increase in green in premature responding, which you can block with the competitive antagonist bicuculin. Okay, and you can see how that interaction might occur, but it's a very dramatic effect. In the lower graphs, you can show that this region's important simply by um, administering mucimol, the, the GABA-B agonist, to reversibly inactivate um, this region. You can see that mucimol has a dramatic effect of increasing premature responding. But of course, if we're thinking about treatments for impulsivity, um, we don't want to be using bicuculin for obvious reasons, so we switched our attention to metabotrophic glutamate receptors, again in collaboration with Boehringer Ingleheim. And they had um, a great interest in looking at uh, the MGLUR5 metabotrophic receptor and its relationship with the NMDA receptor. And one of their tool compounds is a positive allosteric modulator. This work was done by um, a PhD student of mine, Sarah Isherwood. And all this work, this drug is given systemically the drug is ADX47, etc. On the lower, in the top left, animals were treated with MK801, the NMDA receptor antagonist, increasing premature responding, but being attenuated by this positive allosteric modulator for the metabotrophic 5 receptor. And it's a very selective effect. It wasn't uh, associated with changes in emissions, um, accuracy, response latencies, or at least appreciable changes. And if anything, the positive allosteric modular improved the attentional accuracy on this task. So I've talked a lot about premature responding, but it's not the only form of impulsivity. The other very important point, which I, I did emphasize at the start of this lecture, is delay discounting. When 
people, in fact, all mammalian species are offered a choice, a choice between a low magnitude immediate reward versus a larger magnitude but delayed reward. Eventually, after delay, we will opt for the smaller magnitude reward. The delay becomes very aversive, and we begin to not tolerate those delays very well. These curves, these hyperbolic discounting curves, reflect how we subjectively rate delayed rewards. And what you can do, you can stratify participants on these tasks according to low, moderate, or high levels of impulsivity, depending on this K value. A very high K value, you have a very steep discounting function shown there in red. That's an impulsive phenotype. In other words, when the delay is imposed, you prefer the immediate small magnitude reward. In humans, often it's, it's done with hypothetical rewards. You're offered 10 pounds now or 100 pounds next week or a month and so on. And you find an indifference point where both are acceptable, but you kind of keep adjusting those, those two. In animals, we do it with food. And you can show exactly the same hyperbolic discounting functions in rats. Um, on the y-axis, you're looking at the preference for the large magnitude reward. Of course, at zero delay, your preference should always be for the large magnitude reward. But your, your preference drops away <coughs> as the delay is increased. Now, with Bowringer again, <coughs> we've used, in this case, a number of drugs at the metabotrophic 5 receptor, negative, positive allosteric modulators, um, a competitive antagonist, and absolutely no effect of these compounds. So the effect, it seems, is more on the motoric forms of impulsivity rather than the choice forms of impulsivity. Finally, in this, this block, um, the other metabotrophic receptor we've been looking at and rather interested in is the uh, group 3 metabotrophic receptor, the MGLUR4. It's expressed on striatal palatal neurons. Um, there are several interesting tool compounds which are, are used, but the idea here is that we could provide a softer way of treating impulsivity through modulation of either the indirect or the direct pathways through the basal ganglia. And compound 11 um, is the tool compound we've been using. Again, this is work with Sarah Isherwood through Boehringer. Compound 11, this is a positive allosteric modulator, significantly increases premature responding on this task. Um, but interestingly, there's a striking interaction with D2 receptor antagonists. Now, of course, the D2 receptor is expressed within the indirect pathway. Up far on the far left there, you can see in the blue dots the expression of the MGLOR receptors. So to us, it's a very interesting relationship. It seems to be on the premature responding rather than delay discounting. The task is working. You can see d amphetamine when it's administered to systemically animals. It makes them less impulsive on these delay discounting tasks. But the positive allosteric modulator, the MGLOR4, is having no significant effect. OK. I well, want now just to switch to impulsivity as an antecedent, a forerunner for addiction. And I published this paper 2010 in the British Journal of, of Pharmacology. And the zippy was the zippy you saw earlier, um, where we looked at positron emission tomography and trying to understand more about the neuropharmacology of vulnerability for addiction. And I show this picture um, for two reasons. One, it's a picture of David Nutt. David Nutt was my second um, postdoc mentor, and Claire Stanford was my first uh, postdoc mentor. The second reason for showing this slide is to remind everyone of the harms of um, drug abuse, um, alcohol being the leading cause both to individuals and society, according to this um, scale. Cocaine-related deaths, stimulant-related deaths are increasing. We've all heard about the opioid problems of fentanyl and the like. And it never goes away in the BBC of all the news articles on this topic. And I just noticed this morning, I looked at the slide, Brexit also appears. So I think it's probably another topic which keeps reoccurring in the BBC news. So the harms caused by addiction are important. But more important is how we think about addiction. In the 1980s, in the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we thought about tolerance and we thought about withdrawal. 
these were drug-related effects, and essentially the, our subjective effects, uh, liking responses and how we would think about drugs was through pharmacological tolerance, that you would need more drug to produce the same subjective effects. We now think more in terms, in, in DMS5, about the choice that individuals have, either for instant gratification or the denial of delayed harms. And I'll talk about this myopia around rewards. Individuals who abuse drugs are very clear in their own minds, I'm quite sure, about the harms of alcohol and stimulant use, smoking, the effects on the central nervous system. But eventually, those punishment signals become attenuated. And our work in Cambridge now and other, other places around the world are, are trying to work out why behavior continues and these punishment signals become suppressed. And only last week or the week before, another paper on the punishment signal, a circuit in prefrontal cortex into the periactal ductal gray has been implicated in compulsive alcohol seeking. So it's an area now of really rich and fertile um, research. <clears throat> these are um, old data using uh, drug, intravenous drug self-administration. Here we have a paradigm when a rat is pressing one or two levers, inactive or active. A single press on the active lever, say on the far right, will deliver a small infusion of cocaine or heroin or other uh, abused drug. Looking at heroin, on the left graph there, um, so the number of infusions taken between high and low impulsive animals, you see a within session increase in the number of infusions taken, but no difference between the impulsivity um, groupings. By contrast, with cocaine, it's the high impulsive animal which shows escalation of cocaine self-administration. And Dana Economadu used a punishment schedule where a choice was offered between either working on the lever for an infusion of cocaine or receiving punishment. In this case, the punishment is shown, the punishment schedule is shown there under punishment. And with this particular schedule, all animals, low and high impulsive animals, decrease their responding for cocaine. And under the following cocaine long access, the procedure was repeated, and you can again see that punishment was sufficient to suppress responding. In this far right graph, this is a reinstatement procedure. Simply animals were put back in the context, and what you're measuring here is a number of lever responses in the high and low impulsive animals. And you can see that it's the high impulsive animals which show this heightened propensity to reinstate responding for cocaine under these conditions. But we now need to think about compulsion and how we should be thinking about measuring compulsion. We can come back to cocaine self-administration, the advantages of which is that the animal is under control of its own, own drug use. It's volitional, so the experimenter is not systemically administering drugs, so there is control over drug intake. What we've added in this procedure is the same as what we have just shown you in the last slide, but here we have mild punishment. So it's essentially almost like a Vogel scale. It's a tension or a conflict procedure where there's an opportunity to receive cocaine, but on some trials, on 50% of trials, there could be a mild aversive foot shock. If you're under those conditions and you look at all animals, you'll see there's a group in blue that disregard the punishment, an intermediate group which shows some suppression, and a group in green which are very sensitive to the punishment, despite the cocaine being available. And we look at those ratios, and the blue is about 18% of those animals are showing resistance to punishment under the schedule. And David Balan um, published, we published a paper in 2008 um, looking at various phenotypes in rodents which have been implicated um, in uh, drug addiction um, from zero and three criteria. I won't go for that today. The low and the high responder are, are novelty-seeking animals, which is based around locomotor activity in novel arenas. But if you look at the contrast in the low and the high impulsive animals, it's the high impulsive animal which persists in responding despite this punishment. Now, in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about one study we're doing now. This is an MRC program grant looking at um, about 60 animals, 
and it's longitudinal, it's across the lifespan, we start imaging at postnatal day 21. So we have a very small rat in this field of 9.4 Tesla. We continue to scan 35, 62, <clears throat> and then we have a period of behavioral phenotyping. In those same animals, we look at the sign goal trackers. Um, several groups in the world are, are very interested in animals which condition to secondary uh, stimuli in the environment with, which supports drug taking. Five choice zero reaction time for impulsivity. Reversal learning for behavioral flexibility of responding. Elevated plus maze for anxiety. Locomotor activity, the so-called novelty seeking phenotypes. And novelty preference, novel versus familiar environments. It's, all been, it's also been tested. That followed uh, a, a fourth scan, MRI scan, a period of cocaine self-administration, followed by an ex vivo scan. So we have longitudinal scanning, deep behavioral phenotyping, and at the end of it all, some of these animals will show compulsive cocaine self-administration. And by having these very early developmental scans, we hope to go back and understand whether these biomarkers which have identified an impulsivity bear some relationship with the animals which eventually go on to show compulsion. And I won't bore you with the details. If you're interested in the, the behavioral approaches we're using, they're all indicated um, in this recent review. Um, we're using a number of imaging techniques from resting state functional networks where we're looking at synchrony of the bold signal um, from frontal, striatal, uh, temporal lobe. That's our data on the left. This is published from other groups in America um, in rats and um, non-human primates showing a very close correspondence. But I would like to draw your attention just to one finding which is coming back to the insular cortex. These are the very early scans. This is the postnatal day 21 uh, and 35. What we're looking at here is the volume. This is a structural scan, simply the volume of the insular cortex at these very early developmental periods. This probability on the x-axis is the probability of the, of the lose shift. This is a, a reversal learning paradigm. Simply animals are responding on one, for one exemplar on a touch screen and subtly we change the contingency and they have to change to the other side. But there's no cue or indication that it, and they make mistakes. They perseverate on the previously rewarded uh, exemplar. This conventional measure of flexibility means that if you make an error, what's the probability that you'll stick with that error or you'll shift to the opposing stimulus? And if you're very flexible, that's seen as a positive phenotype. If you're rigid around your previous choices, that's a negative outcome. And you can see, actually, that if you have a very small insula very early on, before any of the behavioral phenotyping, before any cocaine exposure, it means that your probability of shifting following a loss is very low. And it's striking that you see it in two developmental scans. So, I'm almost out of time, but I come back to this insular cortex, which I've now come up with the shining, the dark side of impulsivity. And so those who know about uh, George Cube about the dark side of addiction. Actually, the dark side of impulsivity is that it's, its very close relationship with compulsivity. The transfer is still unknown, but one of the important brain regions appears to be the insular cortex. This may be developmentally determined, and we, we're thinking about that. But essentially, we have two systems. We have a prefrontal region, which is about restraint and patience, which is providing an overarching control over subcortical regions, which are more reflexive in their expression. You can see that the insular cortex is involved in the, the reflective, the, the overview of what's happening. It's taking all the internal signals and integrating those signals. The effective, or the insular cortex is providing the, the effective interface, how our mood alters our risk-taking behavior. And we think that is what's coupling to compulsivity. And finally, I mean, I don't need to say these words. Impulsivity is multidimensional. It's linked to many disorders. Uh, we still don't agree on the precise defining features of impulsivity, but we're much closer in categorizing various forms of impulsivity. Um, Non-invasive imaging has its advantages because it provides the bridge to imaging in humans, and I think that's very important when you're thinking of these studies and thinking of the etiologies 
of constructs like impulsivity. And I come back to the insular cortex, it's one that simply won't go away in the work that, that we're carrying out. And finally, uh, I should acknowledge funding from the MRC, Wellcome Trust, Boehringer Ingelheim, European Grants, GSK for sponsoring um, this talk, but also for other work that we're involved with in Cambridge. And with that, with two minutes, um, I'll stop and thank everyone for their attention. Thank you, Jeff, for a very compulsive talk. <laughs> We've time for a couple of brief questions, <clears throat> uh, but if you could use a micro microscope. <laughs> One of the things at the back, please. <laughs> Jeff, thank you very much for a great talk. This idea of um, people going for the immediate reward rather than the delayed reward, I mean, this must be really important to the gambling industry when people are gambling online and whether or not they cash out now or, or wait a little bit longer. And have you looked at um, sort of different drugs that people would use socially? <clears throat> so if, if you'd use caffeine, alcohol, cocaine or whatever, how, how that disrupts that so that maybe once one day you would cash in early because you were just stone cold sober and the next day you would, you would wait and, and, and do we know these things? Yeah. That, that's a wonderful question because the mistake would be from this talk, you come away with the sense that impulsivity equals drug addiction and all that. It's not. The behavioural addictions from pathological gambling, um, eating disorders, all at the heart have immediate gratification at some point, not all, but at some of it, and disregarding outcomes of your behavior. So things can just happen. Now, we haven't done that work, but people like Luke Clark, who's now in Vancouver, are thinking that when you're gambling and consuming alcohol or you're smoking, what impact, what modulator impacts they're having on subsequent behavior? And, you know, I think it's, it's you know, probably obvious, but it needs to be investigated that they're powerful drivers for the disregard of what might happen, okay? For lots of reasons, but I think it's a really, really important question, yeah. I think we're gonna to have to end it there. Our okay. time is up. Okay. Many thanks, Jeff, for a great speech.